Welcome back. So let's continue now with this practical part because we are going to be using SQL. Just out of curiosity, who says SQL? Who says SQL? Okay, we'll see how that evolves throughout the semester. All right. Um, so uh, what we've seen so far in SQL is the functionality at the level of a relational table. So we can create tables, drop tables, rename tables, add columns, remove columns, rename columns that we've already covered. That's all at the level of, uh, of a DDL, right? Uh, and uh, if we now have the ML, uh, that's the idea that we start manipulating the data itself, the records, and uh, that we just have that, this gigantic data calculator with uh, data flowing around. And uh, it's pretty cool that in Jupyter Notebook, it can not only display numbers, but actual tables. It will actually show you the tables uh, when you have the results of your queries, which is uh, very interactive. Um, so we can insert records. Insert record, rec records, record is the verb and record is the word. I always confuse these two. So we can insert records, delete records, update records, and query records. The one we haven't done is querying records. You already know how to install, uh, uh, to insert, delete, and update uh, records. So we've seen the relational algebra, you know the math. Selection, projection, uh, renaming, uh, and so on. You know the Greek letters for that. Uh, you know the categories of queries. So this is uh, everything we've covered. And we've actually covered all of that. Uh, all of that, yeah, in the previous lecture, the theory. And it's time to put it in practice and uh, use SQL. So just a few words on SQL to make sure that you understand its importance and how it's fundamental to uh, database researchers and data the database industry in general. The first thing is that SQL is a declarative language. This is in contrast to a language like Python or Java or JavaScript or C++, which are imperative, right? In an imperative language, there is an elapse of time and you just do things and do things and do things. Well, more exactly, you tell the computers to do things and then tell the computers to do things, but you basically give instructions to the computer, like do this, assign this value to the variable, uh, as long as this isn't true, then do this and that. So you basically give instructions. Uh, so it's like a cooking recipe. A declarative language doesn't have any of that. In a declarative language, you just declare what you would like. I'd like a veggie menu in the main zone. Uh, so we will see that it's actually pretty simple to use. You just need a few lines of codes uh, instead of otherwise what might take a hundred lines in, uh, in another language. Um, and that's extremely powerful. And the benefit of a declarative language is that since all you tell the computer is what you want, you're basically letting the computer decide what's the best way to compute that. So you're giving a lot of freedom to the computer to decide. And this is called optimizations. And it's a whole field of study by database researchers, how you keep computing things faster and faster and faster, right? So there's a lot of research on how to implement the relational algebra. And in fact, I was speaking with Bowen just uh, before the course that even you are working on a paper on how to compute efficiently joins uh, on, on hardware, right? So there is really a whole field of study. And the reason we can do that is data independence. That is so fundamental. This data independence thing is what allows us to do things declaratively at the level of the tables. And then the physical details, you can do whatever you want and whoever finds the fastest way to do it. Set-based is something else. It's really the idea that we have sets of maps. So when you manipulate a table, you can manipulate millions of records at the same time. Uh, when you have a language like Java or C++ or Python, typically you manipulate one value at the same time, right? You have an object and that object might contain structures, but this is one value at a time. So this is also another distinction. Okay. Uh, now, I, I already told you about the pronunciation. The idea is that it used to be called SQL like this, S-E-Q-U-E-L, but then there was a trademark issue, so it has to be renamed. And then uh, all of the people who were actually originally designed all of these, they kept saying SQL. And then all of the people who worked with them and who worked with the people who worked with people who worked with them, we just, we just say SQL. Um, but SQL is fine too, of course. You, you, you just need to know that it's the same thing. It's not, uh, it's not a different thing. 
All right. So who is ready to start with SQL querying? Yes, on Zoom too? 21 people on Zoom, are you ready? Raise your hands. Everybody is sleeping on Zoom. Do we have anybody on Zoom? <laughs> okay, we have people on Zoom, very good. Um, all right, so let's start. This is a table. I'm going to use this example with, uh, you probably recognize Star Trek. Uh, so that way you know that I'm a fan, but anyway. So um, this is the simplest query that you can um, actually write for a table. It selects everything, select star from persons, where persons is the name of the table. And uh, it's actually not very... Uh, it's kind of boring because it just returns the table. That, that's pretty much what it is. Uh, so it's the idempotent query is the identity function. It just returns all the records with all the attributes. Um, but there is still something I can say here is that there is a difference between these two tables, even though it's not uh, visible maybe at first sight. Um, the table on the top is a table that is actually persisted by PostgreSQL. It has a name, persons. It's stored on the hard drive. If you shut down the computer and switch it back on, it will still be there, right? So this is really a persisted table. The table at the bottom is different. It's just created on the fly. When you type your query in the Jupyter notebook, it appears in there. Uh, if you uh, switch off Jupyter and restart it again, it's gone, right? So this is there is really a difference. This is what I'm not why I'm not putting any name in there, right? It's just some table that you create on the fly. In that case, it's just a coincidence that it's the same, but that's just because the query was like this, right? In practice, the queries will actually output different tables. Okay, select star from persons. And in fact, what's going to happen now uh, in, the, in this course to, to introduce SQL is that I will just keep throwing at you more and more and more features. But this select from, it's kind of the skeleton of everything, right? I will just keep adding things in there, and then you get an idea of, of what you can do. So let's do this. First, I wanted to also say a few words on the fact that when you write this, there's a lot of things that happen in the background that you don't see because of data independence. And one of the things that happens in the background is that PostgreSQL takes your query in, understands what you want to do, and then it's going to orchestrate plenty of things to find the best way to execute your query. And what it does is first, it's called a query plan. A query plan can be can be seen as some sort of um, abstraction of the relational algebra. Uh, it could be seen as a tree. In that case, it's empty. This is why this is so boring, because all we do is just take something and return it. So I just put in a row like this. Uh, but we will see that, uh, that uh, it gets more complex uh, later. For anybody who uh, knows that, does anybody know what an abstract syntax tree is? Compiler design, maybe none, but you, you will understand when I show you more. So here it's really just a simple query. All right, let's start with projection. If the clicker allows me, okay. So first the math that we've already seen, it's the letter pi. And with the letter pi, you can put a subscript uh, that says what columns you want, in that case, A or C. And when you do that, you just uh, you just uh, keep only these columns, throw away the rest. You might have less records. Why? Because of duplicates, right? So it might be that you end up with less records if there were duplicates. All right. Now, how do we do this? So I'm taking yet another table. Uh, this one is persisted. It was SQL. It's already populated. On exam day, it will be there. Just tell you there is this table with that schema. And now this is the query. Now replace the little star with actual names. I say select first name comma birth date from persons. This is a projection. I'm saying that I want specifically the columns first name and birth date. So it's the first column and the fourth column. And what I get is a table with how many columns? Two and how many rows records? Three, exactly, all of them. That's it. Why? Because I didn't create duplicates here. This is why I have three. All right, so I have the first name and I have the birth date. That's my projection query. Uh, all right. Now, 
just some warning that I gave to you. Here I introduced on purpose some uh, duplicates. I changed the birth date of uh, one of them. I can't remember if it was Spock or, 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 or James Kirk, but I put them born on uh, March 22nd, 2233. And uh, since I told you that in practice, if you use PostgreSQL, it's going to assume back semantics. So you will get this and it's not going to eliminate duplicates. Yes? A new back without? Um, did I make a mistake? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the title without title. Oh, uh, oh, this is this is probably what what I meant. Ah, the, the clicker doesn't work. Um, the table you create on the fly it doesn't have a name, right? If that's your question. It is a table, but it doesn't have a name. I'm not giving any name. It's not stored on the hard drive, basically. It's not a table you can reference. It's just appearing in your notebook, right? Yes? Is it? It's kind of a print. You can, you can consider it something that is created and printing on your screen, and then it's forgotten then the engine forgets about it and doesn't have any trace anymore, right? You have ways, of course, of saving it somewhere, right? And you know how to do it. It's with this uh, insert into, right? So you could use create a new table and use insert into in order to save these results somewhere, right? Okay. So this is really just to insist that this is on the fly. That was your question, right? Okay. Yes. So if I were to change the order of columns in the comment, would also the resulting table have the same order of arguments? Uh, it's very likely, yes, but technically it's not because it has to be. It's just that if you look at how it's physically stored on disk, the PostgreSQL is actually going to store the records in this order of the columns on the disk. So since it's lazy, it's just going to give the uh, to give them back in the in the same order. Now, if you say select original series birth date, it's going to put them in the order that you want, right? But remember that this is only the way it's displayed to you, because technically the order of the columns shouldn't matter. I'm saying shouldn't because, as we will see, when you use actual software, it's not as perfect mathematically as it should be, right? So, in theory, data independence should totally protect you. In practice, you will see what we could call data independence leaks, that, that somehow you just observe a, a few physical artifacts. But I'll come back on that. But to come back to your question, if I understand it, in the way it's displayed typically by PostgreSQL will be in the order in which you specify them. That was the original question? Yes? Awesome. Perfect. Uh, question. Yeah. Is there any way to give a new name to the newly generated table? Yes, there is. And I will have slides on that. Yeah, absolutely. You can change the names. That's the raw operator, right? But I'll get to that. Okay. All right. So we get these uh, three uh, records and we don't eliminate the duplicate by default because it's back semantics, but you can do it if you want with select distinct. That's this little delta operator I told you about in the relational algebra. So if we say select distinct, then I will get with duplicate elimination, right? So you can kind of, you can pick what you want in there. All right. So far, so good. So we know how to project things. Now, getting back to the query plan, now it's slightly more complex. We basically have this uh, table that we pick from and we feed it through a pie, uh, through the select statement that selects some of the columns. So now that's my query plan. It's just some visual of the relational algebra that is behind that. And that would be the pie operator and delta if you have the distinct. You can also draw it in this way. I think computer scientists, they like to draw uh, trees uh, or formulas in this way. I'm not sure mathematicians do that very much. They just write down the formula on the blackboard. It looks beautiful. But the computer scientists, they also like to, 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 to draw the formulas with, uh, with things that look like this. Okay, that's called an abstract syntax tree. Uh, all right, no questions? I can continue. Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So the question is, I'm repeating for the people on Zoom to hear, uh, is whether, since I told you that generally SQL is going to work on bags and lists, um, is there any way we could constrain it to say by default, assume everything is a set? Uh, not that I know. Uh, I, I don't think it's possible with PostgreSQL, even though we can research, but uh, no, you also don't think so. Um, but technically, um, somebody could implement a query engine that strictly respects the original semantics. Um, this is really about the real world, really, because uh, we could design an engine like that. Uh, I think that the, the, um, the, the way it has been done in practice is that they, 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 uh, they uh, probably for reasons of performance and optimization, uh, uh, it was easier and more performance to uh, to work on bags and lists. I think that historically, uh, and in fact, I think that the the purists among us, so the purist database researchers, this is something that we regret a bit. Uh, that that the actual engines in real life were not implemented strictly to to strictly implement the data independence. Uh, we just have to live with that. Uh, and uh, to be aware that sometimes it might leak. And I will point them, that to you when, when it happens, right? Um, it's, uh, that's, uh, that's, I guess that's just uh, the real life of a computer scientist. Yeah, all right. But it's a very good question because I would also have expected that. And in fact, if you listen to academics, uh, probably in the database community, a lot of them would push to that, to, to really have clean implementations that shield the user completely, right? Um, and in big data, for engineers, uh, we will see that this doesn't apply just to tables. It also applies to the other uh, data shapes here. But then the evolution of the, the way that things went in the past 20 years, sadly, was a bit away from data independence because people tend to, to, uh, to code a lot closer to the data. And in fact, that's how it was done in the 1960s with tables. And that is, that is, it's a bit sad that it went in that direction. But there is hope, uh, you know, and, uh, and, uh, uh, we, we, the, the, the direction in which it's going is big data is that we slowly add back these levels of abstraction on top of the, of the stack. All right. Did it make sense? Did I answer your question? Okay. Awesome. Uh, all right. Okay. So, uh, now let's rename attributes because that is one of the questions that you asked. Um, that's the row function where I change this to D instead of A. So how, how do I do it with SQL? This is how I'm just selecting the first name as who. So I'm saying now I'm changing the name and birth date as when. And this is what I get, right? I'm going to get the um, new names. You see it changed now to who and when, right? That's what I did. Um, don't be confused by the change of color because I normally I, I spend a lot of time redrawing in everything in yellow for the types to be consistent. And it seems that I'm not sure why they disappeared here, but I, I'll try to make sure that the slides you get online, they have this consistent yellow for the data types. Um, all right, don't let that distract you. So select first name as who, changes the name to who and birth date as when, uh, changes it to when, and this is what you see right here, right? Who, when. Now, um, be careful, and this is again, this is kind of coming back to your question about the data independence leaks, is that technically, because of the fact that the columns shouldn't have the same names, you shouldn't be able to do that, right? You shouldn't be able to create twice the same column. Uh, and it turns out that for some reason that I don't know, maybe some practical consideration, PostgreSQL will not throw an error at you if you do that. I think it's going to just create some fancy column names like who one, who two, or that sort of things, uh, if I correctly remember. Um, but just because it allows you to do that doesn't mean you should. You should not be doing that. I strongly recommend that you do not uh, do that. Because again, it's just going to make up column names that will not even be the ones you asked for, and this is very dangerous, okay? So just a word of warning. Um, okay. And in the worst case, because again, PostgreSQL might do it one way, another engine might do it another way. So if you end up with something like who and who, you, you see that that's not how it's supposed to be. You cannot have twice the same columns. Uh, so this is really taking us out of the safety domain, I would say, of, uh, of relational tables. Okay, so now we have row. 
And uh, that's it. So we have pi and rho, right? We can project, we can rename. Uh, let's move on to selection. Uh, selection, remember, is the sigma. Sigma uh, based on some predicate here. And uh, I take uh, these two rows uh, out of my initial table, right? Um, so now, uh, if I uh, want to implement that in SQL, it's going to be done with the WHERE clause, right? So I add it here, select star for all the columns from person where the last name is Crusher. That's my predicate in the WHERE clause. So I'm going to select now an output with how many columns? Six, and how many rows, records, maps? One, exactly, that's the one with Beverly Crusher, that's it. So here, don't be confused by the fact that the selection is in the where clause, not in the select clause, right? So the projection is in the select clause and the, 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 the selection is in the where clause. So now you know three clauses, select from where, and you also know the as for renaming. Okay, who is following? Okay, because I will keep throwing more. So that is called a query when you have this, like the, the entire query, and this is called a clause. You have the select clause, the from clause, and the where clause, and then these are called the predicates or expressions, what you have inside there, right? So select from where works on the level of a table, right? It's working on the entire table. The predicate here works on single records, one record at a time. For every record, you evaluate that, either it's true or it's false, right? For two of the records, that's false. For one of the records, that's true. So it's called a predicate or an expression, and then inside it's also called expression. So anything that is inside is called an expression. Now, what do we allow in the expressions? Yes, go ahead. So you mean to write to write the query, but without a star, but with the columns is what you mean. Oh, without with you using where? No, no, that that's really syntactically. Selection means that you you filter the rows based on a predicate, and that has to be done in the where clause. It cannot. The the select clause is really about the projection part of the query. You don't have to use the star. You can also combine a projection and a selection together. And then you, you can have select this column, this column, this column from where. You can all use that together, right? It's just that the name of what's in the select clause is always going to be a projection, and what is in the where clause is a selection, right? I might have, do I have? Uh, no, I, have, I, I will have an example of that where we use two, right? The two of them. Um, before that, I wanted to show you what you can put in the WHERE clause, because there is a whole documentation. Of course, it's so large that I cannot tell you everything, but just a few examples. Um, so you can use OR, AND, NOT for the logic. It's to do things like, I want this value in that column to be equal to that, AND I want this value in that column to be larger than that, OR I want this and that. So you can basically have these logical statements in the WHERE clause. So you can use OR, AND, AND, NOT. Uh, and you can, of course, use parentheses whenever you want to override the precedence, right? But this is what you learn in primary school, right? If you have uh, 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 multiplication has precedence over addition, if you want to override that, you just add parentheses, right? And that, that takes care of the trick. So it's the same here. I think that not has the highest precedence, then end, and then or. But if you have any doubt, just put parentheses, and then you're sure. Uh, and then you can have a comparison. Uh, just a few words on the way that this works uh, in uh, in uh, the, 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 the logic lectures. You probably heard that there's true and false, and then you can have all of these logical operators. Who had any lectures on that? Boolean logic? Who never had any? Okay. So the idea is that you can combine true or true is true, right? False or true is true true, false or false is false. And that allows you to make statements um, 
in logic, like uh, my umbrella is yellow and it is raining outside and so on and so on. And then you can assign the truth to all of these uh, statements, right? It's called uh, um, uh, logic or in that case, first order logic. Okay, but it turns out that in SQL, you also have a third possibility that is unknown. Maybe you don't know the truth value or something. When can it happen? When you have nulls. If you compare a null value in a table to a number, it's going to say unknown. You don't know if it's higher or lower, uh, smaller or greater than a value. Uh, so it kind of allows you to compute with three different values. And here it's really just common sense, right? Anything or true is going to be true, right? Uh, imagine that, um, uh, that uh, I'm saying to you, um, there is a table right here, or, and then there's this gigantic noise that prevents you from hearing what I'm saying. Did I say something true or not? Well, the answer is yes, because I said there is a table here or, and it doesn't matter what I say next because there is a table here. But if I say there is a table here and blah, 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 and you don't hear what I'm saying, then you don't know because the truth depends on what I'm saying next, right? And I could be saying something that is true or that is false. So this is really the idea here. So imagine that unknown means you have this noise that covers whatever you're saying and you, you, you don't hear it. But you can still very often infer a few things, right? Unknown or true is always going to be true, uh, but unknown and true might be uh, false, right? So the same with and, so true and true is true, but true and false is false, right? Um, for example, if, I, if I'm telling you there is a table here and there are purple clouds in the sky, this is false. Because if I say and, everything must be true for the statement to be true. All right. And here you also have unknown. And again, this is, uh, this is common sense. But in practice, you don't have to overthink it because when you write actual queries and you're saying select from where, where A is greater than two or B is smaller than one, this is kind of natural to do in a, in a query, right? So we are not going into any formalism regarding that. Uh, all right, and for not, not true is false, not false is true, and not unknown is unknown, right? You also have, for the comparisons, so you have equa equals, greater than, smaller than, smaller or equal, greater than or equal. Uh, but you can also have explicit statements that tests for is it, no, is it null, is it not null, is it true, is it not true, is it false, is it not false, is it unknown, is it not unknown. And this is when you want to um, really uh, test explicitly on the three values logic, right, true, false, unknown. So in, instead of just saying A larger than two, uh, you can say, a larger than two is true, right? And then you're absolutely sure that this is true and not unknown or is false. And then you're, you're sure that it's not in unknowns, right? So it's a way of, it's an advanced way of, uh, of, uh, of querying with more precision. If that confuses you, then that's okay. You can just forget about it. This is already something advanced for the users who want to go to the next level in terms of the control of their queries, right? So who, who understands this, right? Okay, so is true is going to return true if it's true, but not if it's false or not if it's unknown. Uh, is unknown will return true if it's unknown and false if it was true or false. That's the idea. All right, uh, then the comparisons. So you have equals, different. So the great, smaller than, greater than means different. Uh, then you have smaller or equal, greater or equal, smaller strictly and greater strictly. That should be clear, right? These are the comparisons. And then um, you need to be careful with nulls, as I indicated, is that if there is in your table nulls, which I told you there could be, and now you're comparing uh, uh, these values to something, you need to be careful because null equals foobar will tell you unknown, unknown, unknown. So all of that is kind of uh, unknown, right? If it's null, you don't know. So you need to be careful as, as soon as you have nulls in your table. If you don't have nulls anywhere, then you don't need to worry about these things, right? But just expect to have to deal with this kind of uh, corner cases. Okay. But I, I don't think that for the exam, we would push you too much on that. I, I, I don't think there is any intent to go to that, uh, to that level of detail. We, we are not going to trick you, right? We give you data uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and that's it. All right, 
but at least you are aware. And then you can also test for null, right? You can test whether uh, a value is null. For example, imagine that you have a table that contains null in a column. Let's call the column A. Then you can say select star from the table where A is not null, and then you get rid of the nulls. That's pretty much how it works. Does that make sense? Right? Okay. Uh, do not use equal is what I'm saying. If you use equals null, you're going to get an unknown. If you say is null, then you're going to get a real test for whether it's null or not. So that's just a warning. Okay. Then you also have is not distinct from, is distinct from, and so on. Actually, I'm considering removing these slides in the, in the next years because this is already advanced and I'm not sure if it's confusing you more than it's actually helping. Who would like me to remove these slides in the future? The ones with the advanced stuff? Who wants to keep them? Oh, majority to keep them. Okay, then, then I'll keep them. I mean, this is, uh, yeah, just have in mind that this is advanced uh, part of what I'm showing here. Um, keep is okay. Okay, very good. So we have uh, encouragement to keep them. Uh, then what about the uh, arithmetic? So you have plus, minus, times. Computer scientists do not use an X for multiplication. They use the, the asterisk, right? Who knew that? Who didn't? Okay, now you know, right? So it's an asterisk for multiplication, slash for division. Modulo is the percent sign, and this, uh, uh, I think it's called the caret symbol, is the exponentiation, when you want to two to the power of five, for example. And then this is highly advanced, but since you want me to keep these things, I will keep them. You can compute the square root, the cubic root, the factorial, the factorial before or after the value and the absolute value. I'm going to be honest with you, I don't even know that by heart. I mean, when I need that, I would go through the documentation to, uh, to actually know that. And I certainly do not expect this right here, right now, I don't expect you to know that at the exam. Uh, all right, but they are here and there is this huge library of uh, things that you can use in your formulas to put in the where clause. So you can see it's extremely powerful, the sort of things you can do in there. Um, and if you are really, really geeky and feel like a computer scientist, you even have all of these that work on the bit level, on the zeros and ones on the machine. But this is, uh, yeah, uh, trigonometry too, cosine, sine, and so on and so on. So you see there's plenty, plenty of different formulas. You even have radians, degrees, there's even uh, different functions for that. So you see it's extraordinarily large. But in fact, this is what makes a product a good product, right? If you have a database product, if you have hundreds of functions available, your customers are happy because that covers a lot of use cases in physics, you know, in plenty of, uh, of different areas. So it's very important for a database uh, management system to have a very, very large function library like that. Okay. Uh, so now, okay, now you know what to put in the where clause, right? I just gave you a menu from the restaurants and uh, you can pick what you want. So now that I have this select from where and I can even rename, I can have a query plan that starts being fancy, right? With sigma, with pi, with rho and so on. And I can even draw it like this. That's the more conventional way of doing that. It means that it's sigma of pi of rho of the table if I put it in relational algebra, okay? Uh, so now, typically, uh, what's going to happen on the, in the exam generally and in terms of uh, mastery of relational database management systems is that there are four different ways of expressing a query, four of them. The first way is in English. Look for the first and last names of all people age 65 and more. That's an English query. The one you could put in ChatGPT, actually. Now, nowadays, you can directly put that in ChatGPT. Then you have the SQL equivalent on the bottom right, select first last from people where age greater than or equal 65. And now you understand that SQL query, right? Now you know how, what it means. Then there is the relational algebra on the top right, pi first last of sigma h greater than or equal 65 of p. And then there is the query plan on the, on the bottom left. Who sees that the four are equivalents? This is all the same thing. What you need to be able to do at the exam is to map them to each other. So you, we might give you an English statement and it's your job to write the SQL that does it. And then you give us the answer. In other questions, we might give you a relational algebra and ask you with four possibilities in English, what is the correct one, right? I don't think the query plan, we do it. I, at least in past exams, we've never really asked anything about the query plan, but it's just there. But you need to be able to understand how English relational algebra and SQL map to each other, right? 
And in the future, really, I expect that uh, with generative AI and chat GPT, that the, the smart ones, they will actually map automatically to SQL and then, uh, and then uh, uh, issue a request to a relational database. All right. There's a question on the exam. Oh, you want to discuss about the exam. I was also asked at the break. So let's say a few words about the exam. Uh, the question is, is the exam purely based on Jupyter Notebooks? Uh, not purely. There will be a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, it's going to be computer-based first, either in the main building or in early con. You will all have your computer. Uh, and the idea is that uh, you will answer the questions on a, on a Moodle environment. You're going to have Moodle similar to the quiz uh, that will be released uh, in a couple of hours um, for this week, the graded quiz. Um, and the idea is that you will have at most 60 questions at the exam that you answer. Most of them are theoretical. You just answer on your screen the questions and that's it. But you will also have a few practical questions coding with SQL. And what I mean with that is that on the same machine, on, on your exam machine, you will have PostgreSQL installs. You will have a few tables that will already be there that we put there for them for you. And we, we will even tell you ahead of the exam what there is. Um, and then in the Moodle, the question might be an English statement like this, look for this and that. Uh, and please enter the result because, so in that case, there's no result, but typically we ask you for a concrete number or a concrete uh, text. Uh, and this is what we grade, the result of the query. We still ask you for the query as well, uh, to put it in some ungraded box, but we don't consider it for grading. And the idea is that in the Jupyter Notebook, you will have uh, the possibility to write your queries, press enter, and then see the results, and then you just put the results in Moodle. Does that make sense? It should just work. On exam day, you arrive, the data is there, it's pre-populated, you click two or three buttons, and it just works, right? Um, but We've seen in the past that, uh, so the first years we did it without telling you in advance what data it's going to be. Then we realized that it reduces your stress uh, if we show you in advance. So this is the reason why we will give you all of that in advance. You will have the data ahead of the exam. You will have uh, the, the uh, example queries. And uh, we even show you the, the Jupyter notebook that you'll have on exam day. Even that, we give that to you in advance. And if you're curious, you can view the past exams, Jupyter notebooks. They are all in the, in the um, uh, Docker environment that we gave to you. You see all of the past exams. And all of the data of all past exams is already populated in the, in the Jupyter notebook, right? Uh, but the difference is that on exam day, you will have only the data of the exam. You won't have the data that is not part of the exam. So it's going to be clean. All right? Yes? I'm not sure if we write the Jupyter part in like the computer room. Yes, it's all on the computer. So you have the Jupyter notebooks on the same machine as Moodle. And uh, the only thing we grade is the result of the query. We might ask you how many artists have published uh, something with a rating above the average, like that kind of questions. And we only grade the answer, 23, for example. Then you have a second box to put your query. We don't grade it, but it allows us if you have any complaint or you know want us to 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 look at if you disagree with the answer and found another way to give you the answer, then we look at the query to understand what you've been doing. And uh, uh, this is actually very helpful for us when we grade the exam because if we see that half of the students all give the same answer that isn't what we expected, we immediately go to the query and and see what query you wrote. So it's actually helping us if you do that, even though it's not graded. So please do it. Please put the query in there. Yes? Uh, no, I don't. I think it's a simple Jupyter. It, it's, just, uh, it's just a separate window. You have a browser window with uh, the Jupyter notebook and another window with uh, the Moodle quiz. They, they are totally unrelated to each other, right? Just two separate windows. OK? Another question? Uh, for the exam, do we need to use Docker or we can do local installation? There is no Docker. Docker is only for you to test it ahead of the exam and to do the exercises because it's just easiest to install it on any system. On exam day, it's not going to be Docker. It's going to be a Windows virtual machine, right? Uh, and, and, and then you'll directly have the, uh, at, uh, on the bottom of the screen, you have an icon to open uh, the, 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 the Moodle, an icon to open, the, to, to launch uh, the Jupyter notebook and so on, right? And an, and an icon to uh, uh, to open the, the the browser. 
right? It's going to be that simple. There is nothing to install. It's all there. It just works, right? And if something crashes, raise your hands, and uh, either we manage to fix it or we move you to another machine, right? But, uh, uh, but we're there for you, right? However, be aware, I warned you, for example, on the Cartesian product, it's up to you to understand that you shouldn't on exam day issue a Cartesian product query on a million times a million, right? You have to know that because then it's on you, right? If you do this. Um, but uh, we'll still explain to you how to reset, you know, and move you to another machine. But if you lose time because you, you, you issued a query like that, you really need to be aware of these things so to have some understanding of uh, the queries you are writing. Okay. But there's going to be plenty of people to help uh, on exam day. There is another question. Uh, I think he, uh, the person wants to confirm the mathematical algebra symbols. Gamma is for group, sigma is for selection, rho is for column. Rho is for renaming. For renaming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And high is for records. No, it's projection. for projection. projection. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. That's how it works. All right. And this is pretty standard. I think uh, most uh, people agree with these Greek letters. All right. There's the joint symbol too. Okay. What time do we have? We still have a few minutes. Let me show you that, uh, extend a little bit. Um, so I told you that you have the possibility to sort things and that brings you into the list uh, semantics. And the way you do that is quite simple. It's an order by statement. Select star from persons order by birth date. It's going to nicely put the records in the order that you want, right? So now we are really totally in the list of maps semantics. And this is also something that you can do. If you do not have an order by, be prepared for some shuffling, right? Then if you don't say order by, you give the authorization to PostgreSQL to do whatever it wants, okay? Then you can control ascending, descending, right? It's all like in Excel, right? In Excel, you can also say sort ascending, descending, yes? Uh, with what tables? Oh, alter table. Uh, Ah, that is a very good question, in fact, because you might want, I, I, I haven't thought of something like this that you can reorder. Uh, my understanding in general is that when you store the tables, uh, it really depends on the engine. I've, I've seen relational systems do it differently. So some of the systems are going to uh, respect the order in which they store the tuples and, and, uh, and uh, show it to you. There are other engines that don't guarantee you anything. They, they store on the hard drive. They give you no guarantee that the order of these tuples is going to be preserved whatsoever. The only order guarantee you have is when you use an order by, when you specify it. But this so much depends on the engine, right? There are engines that are going to keep shuffling around and just keep changing the order. There are other engines that are trying to be nice with you in the sense that they will try to keep the insertion order. Uh, to, to not confuse you too much. This is highly dependent on the product that you are using. Now, your original question is, can we do alter table to modify the order? Uh, I, I've never heard of that, uh, but I could imagine that some database system might want to implement something like that. Um, what you could potentially do is issue a query like that, order by, and nest it into an insert into query. And maybe if the system does that, it's going to store it in that order to the other table. So that might actually work. It would create a new table. It would not modify it in place. You really have to visualize. Imagine the cost that it would take to shuffle around the table that's already stored on disk. You would have to rewrite the entire table. It could even take maybe half an hour to do something like this. So this is maybe the, the, the reason why they are not actually uh, supporting things like this, right? Yes? Oh, you can absolutely with insert into. You say create stable and then insert into this. Yeah. In insert into, I showed it to you with values, right? But instead of values, you can put a select from where and it works too. Right? Yeah. So you can save it to another table. Right. Yeah, I, I will say a few words also next week about that, how we nest queries, right? I think it's it's uh, noon now, so I probably, I sense that some of you want to go, 
Do, do, I still, uh, do I still take a question? Oh, we have to go. Let, let me answer offline. You can come to us and, uh, and uh, we'll answer that. So thank you very much uh, for coming and I'll continue with this next week and then you'll, have, uh, you'll do it in the, in the notebooks. Thank you very much. <laughs>